Well, I'm Tyson Jolly. I'm a local artist. I don't know what you'd call me. Everyone can call me whatever they want. I just try and facilitate. I have a space here called the Grey Area um, that's a sort of like halfway house of existence and non-existence for something that's quite public and in the same side, private. The relationship that I and Tina have come or sprang up because I'd set up my area here in the grey area, my studio slash gallery, um, just for, to enable people that need the space to execute something artistic. And so it was sort of like a natural progression, the marriage between Tina and I. Um, and it just came through a history of this space being used for Crack Theatre or Crack Festival, which is a, is a collaborative effort with Tina. You know, they partnered together to make out or to make up the programming. Um, and because I'd used my space in the past, they got in contact with my landlord, Kerry, and then got in contact with me. Um, we had a conversation about what it is they're trying to achieve and how I could facilitate or help that. We worked out that it was definitely viable and it's definitely aligns with something that I was hoping to do in the space. So we had the Mess League here on Thursday night. Um, they were a, a drama production group and it was a conceptualised sort of like event where they'd use the same parameters of like your sports, like your ESPN, your NBA, MLB, a bunch of like pre-designed American sports and the coverage of them. And they associated that with a newfound made up sport, which was the sport of cleaning and messing up. team had to make up the mess the other team's job was to clean it up but we had like some really great like comedy in between particularly with the commentary of it all and the governance like the refereeing and that Messi, we're now bring out the cups yeah and the cups are out ladies and gentlemen and the crowd goes nuts for the bring cups bring out the cups <laughs> the crowd goes nuts for the cups <laughs> i love you guys that's really really cool it's very frantic
It's quite frantic and chaotic. The satirical nature of it all really, I guess, <laughs> I don't know, it's just, I don't know what to expect. And after I'd finished experiencing the whole thing, I still didn't even know what had just happened. So I guess it succeeded in its attempt, whatever that was. The programmer for the Friday night was, they had a bunch of, uh, I'd say experimental musicians and artists to come in and um, deliver their own productions. Each time might have been a 30 to 40 minute set, more like a viewing party than it was um, any sort of theatrical performance. But yeah, but that, that, you know, they're important, those things. Yeah, that's, I think, very important for the culture, for people just to be able to come and enjoy music. I must have been three years old, and I remember we were at the swimming pool. There was this guy there, an Olympic swimming coach. He was a huge man, built like a barn door. And what he did was, is he picked me up, and he threw me in the pool. And what happened? I sank. I went under and I was drowning. And then, I rose up again. And there was his face at the end of the pool, shouting, Sink or swim! Sink or swim! Mapping the turtle. Well, I'd seen it prior as well because, you know, I'm in here in the gallery all the time. I'm seeing everyone come in and, you know, do their rehearsals and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Living in a shack, like, building at the bottom of the garden. I can't believe you had black servants in the 1970s. It wasn't like that. They were incredibly well treated. Do you remember their names? Afi Afi Mobile. I loved them. They were like brothers to me. They used to carry me on their backs. My parents were away so much that uh, I their pidgin English is my first language. I mean, once I moved to England, I lost my first language. And it's sad, really. I, I can't remember any of it now. Um, they performed again on the Saturday, so I missed them because I was obviously getting dinner on the Friday night on my way to the, back to the gallery. You need to lighten up. Manta Ray Martin were two blokes from Perth. They've flown over and they deliver, I guess, a range of instruments and practices of how they get their music across. I know one of the blokes, Dan, had an octopad, plus played synth. Uh, the other dude, who I can't remember his name, so he has to forgive me for now, he was also playing synth. It was really just like really atmospheric. I don't know, let's say like feeling provoking moot music, you know. at times, it was ambient at times, it had a lot of like natural sounds, had, you know, it sounded like at times you're in a rainforest, you know, some shit like that, so I don't know how you'd describe it, it was atmospheric and ambient and really nice.
I'd actually like to see him perform, perform like a, I felt like because here in Newey, everyone's quite laid out of the blocks when it comes to a night. You know, no one really is out seven to eight o'clock. Everyone's still gotten home after their big day at work and they still want to spend a bit of time at home and gather themselves, I'd imagine. So it was quite a few people here, but I liked, yeah, definitely if I got an opportunity to see them in a space that had a bit more people, you know, brimming would be great for, for the atmosphere, I think. But yeah, definitely give me a chance to see him again, I'll see him again. It felt digitally analogue, you know, it felt like a new modern uh, attempt at making music but it had these familiar old feelings that come with, I believe, like the old modular sense, you know, the old school um, dynamics of how digital music was made, but they were using modern instruments. Yeah, so the, their third act of the night um, and their whole production was designed towards, let's say, the development of sound originating from first organic sounds and compositions of what can happen by they started tapping using, you know, physical product, uh, percussion and then went into using their breath, which is the wind, moved that into their wind instruments, their saxophones. So, it, I don't know, it felt like a, a, develop, a development of a biology of sort. You know, like it went from being just organically percussive and, you know, wind produced organically to then using other things to create sounds that you're still using the same practice. So, so it really like felt like this development of sound and development of practice to produce sound. Yeah, well, it, it, it was captivating. I think it's the best way you can describe it because, like, and I think that's with any great narrative, it's captivating by its essence, not by, let's say, the old school methods of captivation. It was literally like, it was interesting. You didn't know what it was, and so you had to create your own conclusion. The only way you could do that was by watching it and trying to work it out. So, and I think that's, in my eyes, that's, good art does that. You know, good art doesn't give you the answers, it gives you the questions. And I think you are, you, you are your own answers to them questions. You know, shit art does that too, but good art trying to do that. That was the slam, I believe. Um, that was pretty cool. That was just a loose, organically like delivered, let's say poetry slam. You know, there's people that had their pre-designed poems and the things, messages I'll come here with, and then they opened it up prior to it as well. Anyone that would like to just jump up and have a crack, you know, in, in the same theme as crack theatre. You've been quiet. A torpid one, a mute blue wash ensnared. Congealed, soldered with molten love to the hips. Species chewed blue glue when I watched the telly, I'm connected to you. I am your favorite show. What's your favorite show? It worked out really well because we had the Blue Collective boys on hand, Dan Simmons um, and Jimmy Jones sat in that night for Jesse Dowley on the bass. Him and Maddie Baines and Isaac eventually jumped up too. They were able to then provide some backing music for some of the slam poets um, and some of the people that were just getting up to have a crack. It was pretty cool because uh, like the looseness of it all, the improvisational aspect of it all really sat well with what was already trying to be delivered.
it also shows like the robustness of our little community in here. You know, I think the, that we're not all just like we're all multidisciplined in you know arts. It's not one or the other. So if one of our artistic uh, say endeavors can marry up with another's, then you know it's definitely promoted here in that space. And it was evident by Friday night when we had some poetry jams. You know. <laughs> Two cups of that, I can't get out the front door, which I use to walk down to the store to buy a copy for $5.50 because it's Melbourne. And I have that copy, and I'm up. And it's about 8.30, and I've had three copies, and I'm ready to start the day. And the day is a series of excuses to stop working and get more coffee. Well, I feel like it come into its own more than anything because it was never any design like that. And we had up until the point no idea about how many people would even be here for it. Um, I feel like it sort of like did exactly what it, it had intended to do by coincidence or by proxy or not. Like, I don't know how maybe that's how it was meant to go. Maybe it just went that way because of the night. But either way, it definitely achieved the goal, I think. And it's definitely the feeling amongst the crowd was of that. <laughs> people sort of like on the fence at a certain time then they got off the fence because it was so I guess encapsulating So I'd say it's definitely a collaboration between Crack Festival, This Is Not Art and myself. What it did is it gave me an ability just to like be able to step back for a moment and observe my own space and what has already happened because of my involvement, you know, like maybe at that time it's probably best off for me to just be an observer and learn a bit. That's why there was nothing that alluded to this is my event, but more so I just looked at how I can as a person facilitate and help their event. Because I felt like if I do that, well then we're gonna have more of a community to be able to help us with our next event. And I think we did that. I think we exposed a lot of new people and they're, you know, they're the old heads in the community. They're the ones that have been around. I just hadn't met them yet because I'm still quite new into the, the arts community. I'm not quite new to art, but the arts community around here. So I think it was good. I think we've established even more of a platform. Um, the people were great to work with. The concepts were foreign to me, which is always beneficial for my own growth and learning. I can't really fault anything they've done. You know, even when we had adversity and a lot of the times we had to do things on the fly, everything still worked good and everyone turned up with a smile. So, oh, yeah, geez. I'd work with them in a heartbeat. Dan lost his darts.
Thank you.